move on to our third and uh, last speaker, that is uh, Valentina Borghesani, that moved from uh, San Francisco to Université de Montréal. And we are still on language, but this time is in humans, and it's about uh, what happens in neurodegenerative disorders. Vale? Perfect. Let me share my screen. Is it working? Perfect. Thank you very much, Matteo, for the introduction and for the two beautiful talks that preceded me. Uh, and I'm here today to share with you some of the latest insights that we gathered on the neurobiology of language, thanks to our approach that combines neuroimaging, specifically magnetoencephalography, and a clinical model, that of primary progressive aphasia. And primary progressive aphasia, or PPA, is an umbrella term for three different clinical syndromes in which patients progressively lose speech and language ability due to the neurodegeneration of different left hemisphere language networks. So in the case of the so-called logopenic variant, or LVPPA, phonology and or short-term verbal memory deficits are associated with left temporal parietal atrophy. In the semantic variant, or SDPPA, anterior temporal lobe atrophy is associated with semantic deficits. And finally, in the non-fluent variant, or NFVPPA, grammar and or speech motor deficits are associated with inferior frontal gyrus atrophy. So today, I will focus specifically on the semantic variant PPA and illustrate what we learned about the spatiotemporal features of language networks given three key aspects of these patients' profile, namely that they misread irregular words, such as reading chore instead of choir. They can tell you whether in a given picture there's an animal or an object, but they cannot name it. And if asked uh, to give a verb in response to a noun, such as say bike, they would produce a very common so-called light verb, such as to do, instead of something more specific as to ride. So in a recent published work, we show that reading irregular words in these patients is associated with over-recruitment of parietal cortices. And this fits nicely with the double route model of reading, which theorized the existence of a ventral lexical semantic route that allows you to read correctly irregular words that you have to have learned by heart. And a dorsal route that is sublexical, phonological, that allows you to just translate from grapheme to phoneme based on the rules of your language. So in these patients, given their atrophy, given their damage on the ventral route, on the anterior temporal lobe, apparently they have to over-rely, over-recruit the dorsal route to be able to read. In a second similar study that is currently <laughs> under revision, uh, we show that a uh, semantic patient can correctly classify images as belonging to either a living or a non-living category even if they cannot name them. So they cannot name the item, they cannot tell you, that, tell you that it's a zebra, but it can tell you that it's probably a living being. And in the MEG data, we see that this is associated with um, greater activation over bilateral occipital cortices, as well as superior temporal gyrus, and somewhat um, inconsistent engagement of frontal regions. So the idea here is that the over-recruitment of these posterior occipital cortices might be linked to an over-reliance on perceptual feature as opposed to more conceptual one to solve the task. So as we said, they have this atrophy in the anterior temporal lobe, so they cannot rely on those conceptual features, but they still maintain uh, the perceptual one. And finally, and this is very much preliminary data, we observe that when asked to produce a verb in response, like a verb that is semantically related to a given noun that you give as a prompt, semantic dementia patients produce a higher number of unrelated verb, in particular, the so-called light verbs, such as to do, to make, to get, very generic ones. And this is in contrast with the other two variants of primary progressive aphasias in which we see a completely different error pattern. The logopenic variant patients have the lowest accuracy and produce the highest percentage of not a verb response. So they would produce a noun instead of a verb. 
may be related, but not a bird. While the non-fluent patients have the best performance, and when they fail, it's just because they miss a trial. They don't give the, the, the an answer. So taken together, our findings have important implication for the clinical phenotyping of this uh, different variants of primary progressive aphasia, as well as for the theoretical model of the neurobiology of language, in particular, the results that I've showed you um, concerning semantics. So we have seen that semantic variant patients with, uh, given their ATL atrophy, have profound semantic deficits which translate into an over-recruitment of phonological processes in dorsal regions to read irregular words, and an over-reliance on perceptual feature in posterior regions to classify items. So this overall, these findings indicate a pervasive reorganization of the brain network in response to the neurodegeneration. And they show us how defective semantic representation can be compensated by enhancing perceptual processing in occipital regions and um, spare the computation in dorsal networks. And with this, I would like to thank my collaborators, but especially our patients and their families for their time in our research. And I'm very happy to take any question. Thank you, Valentina. Uh, I will start with questions. Uh, um, I'm curious because uh, uh, this is the, um, what these patients uh, uh, manifested is a, a lot similar to what happens with the uh, people that have uh, uh, lesions or resections in uh, areas that are connected from those pathways. So I wanted to ask you, do you expect that the, the neurodegeneration is happening just in the gray matter or also in the white matter? For example, I think about uh, the uncinate, the IFOF and these, uh, these pathways. Absolutely. So with, um, with the semantic patients, we know that the atrophy starts in the gray matter of the anterior temporal lobe and it's spread posteriorly. And the more it spreads, the more it affects also the wide matter paths that are uh, nearby. With the other variants of primary progressive aphasia, the involvement of the wide matter is even um, bigger at the big already early in the disease. So definitely we have to look not only at gray matter, but also at white matter in, in these patients. Absolutely. But it originates in the gray matter. No, that's very interesting. So we have a, a first question from um, Joao Araujo. Would, wouldn't you expect errors in uh, grapheme phoneme decoding in uh, PPA, given that you should have uh, to access the auditory targets anyway? Or is it possible to access phonological representations without auditory cortex activations? Uh, it's a very, very good question, and it's one of the things that makes interesting the comparison between the variants. So the semantic variants, which is the one I've studied reading in, since they have this lesion in the anterior temporal lobe, but the superior temporal and the parietal areas are spared, for them, uh, the phonological processing is intact. So they don't make errors, phonological errors, because they don't have a lesion in that area. But in the other variant, the logopenic variant, where the atrophy is actually more prevalent, superior temporal and inferior parietal, in this variant, you do see those phonological errors because in those patients, the translation from grapheme and phoneme is affected. Okay, that's very interesting. And to follow up on my previous question, um, of course, I don't know if you have uh, any... Uh, and, and, uh, and uh, enough patients to do this. But uh, if you had enough patients, would you be able to stratify them uh, um, depending on uh, how long the, they have been uh, in, uh, the, in the disorder and then uh, to see if uh, you start to see um, a difference in the MEG um, activations in the frontal that will start uh, moving uh, more backwards? Absolutely, that's a wonderful question. That it, it is an important factor how long they have, like the time since the diagnosis, how long they have been into the disease. Um, 
the problem, as you hinted at, is that this is a rare disease. So we don't have enough patients to do group comparison at, mm -hmm. let's say, three different stages of the disease. We do uh, use um, a measure of their overall status, like a neuropsychological measure of their overall status as a correction for some of our analysis to try to uh, regress out the, the factor disease duration. And in other studies that are not imaging based, well, we look at the behavioral, we do have enough patients. But for the imaging studies, um, it's really difficult to find patients that are functional enough to undergo MEG. Um, so we don't, we just don't have enough data to do that. But it is a definitely an, a, a variable of importance. And I imagine that there is a similar problem if you would like to acquire uh, also fMRI and uh, DTI and more complex things. So uh, we do not get FM task-based fMRI in these patients. For most of them, we do have resting state fMRI and we do okay. have DTI because we, okay. uh, we acquire those when we get... Um, the T1, the, the, the map of, that we use to compute the atrophy. So that's a, it's a very interesting data set and we will eventually merge the thing. Okay, that sounds very interesting. Okay, so we have another question from uh, Luis Fernando Zuluaga. Can you comment on some of the differences between uh, logopenic variants in PPA versus Alzheimer patients with logopenia? Yeah. Uh, this okay. So this is a hundred million <laughs> dollar question. So um, the logopenic variant of PPA, uh, ninety percent of the time is due to Alzheimer's disease. So the underlying pathology in the logopenic variant um, patients is Alzheimer pathology. That for some reason that we still don't really know affects in these particular patients, the language network in the superior temporal and parietal areas before the hippocampus. So these patients don't have the typical memory problems that you see in the prototypical Alzheimer dementia patients, but they have logopenic uh, variant PPA. But the underlying pathology is Alzheimer's disease. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important to do an accurate um, diagnosis of these patients. Because once you put them in the right, uh, under the right clinical label, logopenic variant PPA, then you are pretty much certain on what is the underlying pathology and it's Alzheimer. And this has been proven with PET imaging as well as post-mortem um, findings at autopsy. Do you have a similar confound for uh, the, the semantic variant? Are there some cases... Uh, due to some other uh, different pathology? So the semantic one are, again, I would say even more strongly, like 98% of the time, TDP43C uh, pathology. So it's a different kind of uh, neurodegeneration due to the unfold, the misfolding of a different protein. Uh, but it's a pre again a pretty homogeneous uh, group, uh, pathologically speaking. Uh, the non-fluent variant PPA, the one that is more frontal, that's where we see more uh, mixed pathologies. And it's harder, given the clinical label, to match it to the underlying uh, neurodegeneration. But for semantic and for logopenic, it's almost clear-cut. Okay. Is there any, any final question from... Uh... Any of the participants, also the previous panelists for uh, Valentina? Actually, I asked it and I have the question. <laughs> Again, from uh, Joao Araujo, uh, would like to hear your thoughts uh, on how studying a more semantic variation of PPA, of how a more studying a, a more semantic variation of PPA can help us to know more about the structure of a semantic system in the human brain. And what are the most striking insights we got from studying this type of PPA? Yeah, um, I do think that the most striking um, result in absolute term is the importance of the anterior temporal lobe as a semantic up. A lot of uh, uh, functional neuroimaging uh, result, uh, 
data findings in healthy subjects show us that a large distributed portion of the cortex responds to semantic stimuli. But the fact that it activates doesn't mean that it's necessary to process semantic. So what these patients are telling us is that while a lot of the cortex must, might be involved, this area, the anterior temporal lobe, is the critical one without where you have semantic deficit. And it doesn't happen with lesion in other part of the brain. And then when you start looking in detail at the kind of deficits that these patients have, we can try to learn more and more about how the semantic hub is organized. For example, we, uh, we think by looking more carefully at the different um, uh, fine-grained uh, deficits that these patients have, comparing the ones that have more medial versus more lateral, more left versus more right atrophy, uh, we can understand how semantic is organized in the anterior temporal lobe because the computations that are building these representations are probably graded and distributed within the ATL. Yeah, I think it's a great pathology model for studying that. Very interesting, extremely interesting. Okay, and now we are at 46, so it's almost...